about the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus, who being in very near to God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When Jesus returns, every knee will bow, everyone will confess that Jesus is Lord. What a joy for us this morning to be choosing to do that now, ahead of that day. So let's stand together and worship the exalted Christ as we sing, O oh my soul, arise and bless your maker, for he is your master and your friend, slow to rock, but rich in tender mercy, worship the Saviour Jesus. Let's stand to sing. together as we continue to worship the Lord as we pray. 
King of Grace, your love is overwhelming. <coughs> Bread of life, you're all I ever need. Your blood has purchased us forever, bought at the cross of Jesus. Father, we are glad to be together this morning on the Lord's Day to praise you. We praise you for your great strength. And Lord, some of us need to be reminded of that this morning, that you are a strong and powerful God who carries us. We thank you that you weigh the mountains on the scales and the hills in the balance. Such is your might and your power. We praise you for your supremacy. Compared to all the nations, you, they are just like a drop in the bucket compared to you. And we praise you for your intimate care. You carry us close to your heart, dealing gently and tenderly and graciously with us. Thank you for that. We rejoice, Father, that you have fixed a time when you will send your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, back to this earth. We know that currently you are patiently waiting for more people to join your kingdom. We ask that you would please advance your kingdom throughout the world because we want Jesus to return. We want all those people to enter in and so Jesus can come back and wipe away all our tears so Jesus can receive the glory that's due to him. So please save people from every tribe and nation and bring them into your kingdom. We do thank you that when we will see Jesus, we will be made like him. All our struggling with doubt and fear and sin will be over. Thank you that all conflict will be gone from this earth as well. But as we wait patiently for that day, please give us the resources and strength to live in a Christ-honouring way, no matter what it is we face each day. We ask for your forgiveness, Father. At times we're not alert to this day. We don't have our attention fixed in that direction at all. Sometimes we're not sober-minded and self-controlled. We live as though there is no resurrection from the dead and this life is all that there is and you're not watching, that you're not at work in our hearts. And so, Father, we ask that you would forgive us and wash all our sin away because of Christ. Please would you give us hearts that are fixed entirely on you and not divided at all. We believe, but we say help our unbelief. Specifically this morning, we pray for the country of Senegal. We thank you for our mission partner, David, over there, who is serving. We, we ask that you would help him as he reaches out again to the Malinke tribe. We ask that the church would be formed there, that there would be those who would step up and be leaders and teach the word. We thank you for all the different means that he is using to spread the gospel. We pray for radio broadcasts, for different devices that are used, and we ask that through that, um, the church would be established. But we also pray for his family. We recognise it's a great cost for them, for him to be away. Lord, please would you bless them in their situation. Be unto them everything that they need. Lord, please bless and put a hedge around that family. We also pray for the church closer to home. We pray for the church in Parbol. Thank you for Seth and his diligent work there. We ask that even this morning, as I, I expect he's preaching, that you would strengthen him, that at that church more people would come to know and trust Jesus. And for those established believers, we pray that they would have a, a greater depth of understanding of what Jesus has done for them. And finally, for ourselves, whether we are upstairs or downstairs in junior church later on, we pray that all of us would come to understand the absolute importance of being prepared and ready for the day of Christ. Please, Holy Spirit, come and make a difference in our hearts. We need you. We look to you for help. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There are many things that we have to get ready for. 
Um, we all got ready to come to church this morning. Some of us will be already getting ready for our lunch. Maybe you've got a timer set on the oven. Uh, maybe things during this week you're preparing for. But chiefly, the thing we must be prepared for is the return of Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to watch a short song on video. And if you know it, why not sing along? Um, but we'll enjoy this together. A song we've seen before, all about being ready. The computer's not ready. <laughs> There's a storm that's near, we'll want to grab a coat to wear, an umbrella too would be something good, so that we can be prepared, well Jesus said we should plan ahead, because he's coming back one day. should always watch and pray and we'll be glad when the lord comes back if we're trusting him today be ready Just a point of explanation for the children. When we're hearing talking about rain and the umbrellas, it can be a bit confusing. The rain that being, is being spoken of is it doesn't mean it's going to, we're going to get wet all the time. It's talking about how Jesus is going to rule forever and ever and ever. So we need to be ready for that day. Well, to help us be ready, we're going to hear from God's word. We're going to hear uh, what the Bible has to say about that day. Phil is going to come to read to us from First Thessalonians chapter 5. Verses 1 to 11, before we sing again. Thank you, Phil. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. 
for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labour pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Thank you, Phil. We're going to stand to sing two more songs which remind us of the return of Jesus. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, and then there's a sound on the wind. If you're able, please stand as we enjoy singing these together.
great. It's time for Junior Church and Crash to head downstairs. Um, we trust that you will come to understand more about the Lord's second coming. If you have access to a Bible in front of you, just open it to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 again. That'll be helpful as we look at these verses. That can be on paper copy or on some device. Do turn there. Just be useful as we look at God's Word together. Sometimes a situation can creep up on us without uh, any warning and there's no time to plan. Perhaps you get a knock on the door which announces the arrival of somebody you weren't expecting out of the blue, someone you haven't seen in ages. If only you'd known, you'd have been able to do a quick vacuum round and get some <coughs> nice biscuits in maybe, uh, but you have no chance to prepare and nothing you can do about it now whatsoever. But then on other occasions, there are events that are coming up that we know full well they're going to happen. The day is looming large on the calendar we know it's approaching, and so we can do something about it. And that might be something like an upcoming exam. Um, you know it's coming. It's there. There's a date. Some people maybe have got some exams coming up. There's a date in the calendar, and you have time to prepare. If you don't prepare, that will be foolish. And that upcoming exam date changes what you do in the here and now. So instead of relaxing, you'll be reading books. Instead of and um, just, I don't know, meet up with friends, you'll be mulling over potential questions that you might need to answer. What's the alternative to that? Someone said, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. Fail to prepare, prepare to fail. Our section in 1 Thessalonians continues from where we were at last week. It was too hard, if you like. We looked at the first half of the section last week in all age service, and this week we're looking at the second half of that section within this particular letter in the Bible. Last time we listened in as Paul informed the Church of the Thessalonians what had happened to loved ones in Christ who had passed away. The second half of this section describes for us the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is simply a phrase that's used to describe what happens or what's going to happen when Jesus returns. These verses describe that momentous event and also they describe how we can live in the light of what's to come. Last year... I went down to London whilst I was on sabbatical to a conference. And during the lunch break, I went to Leicester Square. As I walked down the, str the street, I saw a man holding a piece of paper um, above his head. It was more paper, it was maybe a thin bit of wood, and it had something written on it. And what was written on it was, Jesus is coming back in 20. 30, and there was lots of other writing on the bottom as well. Um, and I, I took my phone out of my pocket and, and took a sneaky photo as I walked past uh, and zoomed in to the sign to see what else was written on that sign. And I noticed as I zoomed in something quite interesting. Where it said, Jesus is coming back in 2030, I noticed that the 30 was uh, written over white paint. So what had happened was one of two things. Either he made a mistake when he was writing, which is unlikely. I think what had happened was he put a date down on there which had passed. So he had to get his pen out, scribble it out, redo his calculations, and then put the new date 
on that piece of paper, so his prediction, when the Lord Jesus is going to return. And that guy is not the first person to come up with a date as to when the Lord Jesus is going to return. If you want some homework, go home. Actually, don't do this. Don't, don't, do not do this. But you could go home, go onto Wikipedia, which is an online encyclopedia, and simply type in predictions of Jesus' return. And you will see a whole list of people who have predicted when Jesus is going to come back, and they are dates in the past which has proved to be wrong, but then also there's a whole other list of dates in the future, which no doubt will also prove to be wrong as well. And I'm sure it's a tactic of Satan's to influence people into thinking that the return of Christ is either a fairy tale or something that is only believed by slightly unhinged people to get people to give predictions that are proved to be wrong. We mustn't be drawn into specific dates about when Jesus is coming back because people who do that are actually not so good at listening to Jesus at all. Why do I say that? Because Jesus said nobody knows the day or the hour when he is going to return. But despite this, people still look to speculate and come up with dates, including my friend in London using the word friend loosely there. Of course, although I do have a picture of him on my phone, if you would like to see it. It would seem that those types of speculations were also happening back in the first century. Look at verse 1 with me in our Bible reading that Phil read to us earlier in the service. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well, dot, 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 we'll leave it there for a moment. Perhaps in Thessalonica, there were people discussing possibilities of when it might be that the Lord Jesus Christ would return. Speculating, coming up with timetables, making predictions. Well, we know that since the beginning of chapter 4, Paul has been addressing things that are lacking in their faith. We know that from chapter 3. And verse 10, Paul writes there about how he wants to be back in Thessalonica because there are certain things lacking in their faith that he is speaking into. And ahead of his visit, he writes this letter to start, start speaking truth into some of these areas, things that they're believing which are wrong, behaviour which also isn't right in their lives as well. So this is something that they are lacking in their faith. But Paul is saying, about times and dates, I don't need to write to you. Why not? You already know this. But he goes on to tell them anyway. I find that interesting. I don't think Paul here is trying to teach grandma to suck eggs, so to speak. I think he's very aware that even though something might be clear and obvious, when people come along with persuasive language and sounding clever, things that were clear and obvious can quite soon become cloudy. Quite soon, when things that are clear and obvious, when someone comes and puts another spin, we can be led away. And so Paul writes to them things he already, they already know just to make sure they know what's true just to make sure they don't drift away from certainties that the Bible speaks about. So Paul is speaking to them about the day of the Lord when Jesus is coming back. And in verses 1 to 3, he gives us not a date, not a time, but he gives us two images to teach us about what the day of the Lord is going to be like. And these two images, the first one is a thief in the night, and the second one, labour pains. So first, a thief in the night. Look at verse 2. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. I know there are people in this room um, that have quite recently been the victims of an attempted burglary, and it is not a nice feeling at all, is it? When I was growing up, um, we had a few occasions where, as you know, when things were stolen from the farm that I grew up on, 
and um, one time some slates off a building, another time the workshop and a lot of tools were taken, another time the quad bike was stolen and it was bad enough knowing people are snooping about outside the buildings, let alone when someone tries to get in your house. What's the point Paul is making giving us this picture? A thief in the night is an unwelcome, unexpected intruder. You are not waiting for him. You are not expecting him. You do not want him to visit. You do not get up the day after being burgled and go, I knew that was going to happen. I just knew that was going to happen last night. No, of course not. It's an unpleasant shock. If you did know it was going to happen, you would have the lights switched on and a couple of your friendly local policemen hiding behind the sofa ready to grab the people. After being burgled, what do you do? You start saying, what preparations can I make in case this happens again? What, what can I do? Can I install a burglar alarm? Can I put extra locks on the windows? You make provisions of the, if they come tonight, then I'll be ready for them. See, the point is, a thief, their entire advantage is down to their elements of surprise. That's the first point Paul is making about the day of the war. It's going to be an unexpected, unpleasant surprise for so many people, an intrusion into their life. The second picture we're given is of labour pains. This is the second image Paul gives. This is down in verse 3. He gives to the church of the Thessalonians. Life will be going on as normal. People will think they're in peace and safety. They'll be getting on with their usual lives. Everything will just going on as normal. And then all of a sudden, as labour pains come on a pregnant woman, destruction will suddenly fall upon them. And the point here is to do with the inescapability of destruction. As soon as you're pregnant, if, God, if by God's grace you go to full term, you cannot escape. From the pains of labour. That was certainly the case when Paul was writing anyway. Now, of course, there are C-sections and epidural anaesthetic, but not then. The day of the Lord was an inescapable destruction. That's, that's what he's pointing to. It will, it will be an inescapable destruction. And down in verse 9, we see very clearly why that's the case. The day of the Lord is a time when many people will suffer God's wrath. Another Bible book, Paul wrote as well, he described it in this way. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. What's been described in these first three verses in 1 Thessalonians 5 is what the day is going to be like for people who have stubborn and unrepentant hearts. Now I think it's quite interesting when you compare these two images of a thief and the sudden labour pains. Because when you're pregnant, you know what's going to happen. You know what's coming. That seems at odds with the fact that it's going to be like a thief in the night. Did you know our world is groaning because God has subjected it to futility because of sin? Because of our sin, this is a world that is under God's judgment. The reason why there is extreme cold and heat, storms and earthquakes, droughts and flooding, the reason why there are volcanoes and tsunamis is because of God's judgment on this world. This world is a dangerous place to live. But God's judgment is also seen in our own lives. He allows us to go down paths that are not for our good, that will cause us harm. And chiefly, we see God's judgment very clearly in death. And all these things are pictures. All those things are the day of the Lord writ small in everyday life for people to see, for people to know 
what's coming. People should know what's coming. God has given warning after warning of what's coming, but it will still come like a thief in the night. Why? Perhaps they went to the carol service and just thought it was a, a nice story. Perhaps a friend shared the gospel, but they thought they'd, they'd come to that a, another day. Perhaps they were a hardened atheist. And the day of the Lord will come suddenly and destruction will fall upon them. And can you imagine the horror? Can you imagine somebody who spent their life rejecting Jesus to see him coming on the clouds and to realise that they were wrong? And here comes the Saviour, the one who died for them, but yet they turned away from him. They took the life that God had given them stewardship over and they ignored their creator and acted like they were God, living life their own way. A key phrase in Romans that I read earlier about those with stubborn, un unrepentant hearts. It talks about God's righteous judgment. I know this is a very difficult and painful topic for us to be discussing. Because many of us have loved ones who at the moment are rejecting Jesus. Maybe we have loved ones that died and although we don't know about God's grace in the last moments, as far as we know, they had a stubborn and unrepentant heart. Although we can't understand this right now, then when Jesus comes back, we will acknowledge that all he has done is right and good and true. We will praise him for his just judgments. Even if in the here and now we cannot get our heads around that. And that's what Paul is writing about. He doesn't want them to be unaware. He wants them to be, he wants them to be fully in the know about this day that is so clear. That is coming in the future. The day of the Lord that will come like a thief in the night. Like sudden labour pains. And so Paul, he moves on from speaking about the day of the Lord, but he's still speaking about the day of the Lord, but now he speaks about how to live in light of that day. That's our second chunk of verses. So quick recap, Paul's addressing the church at Thessalonica. He's telling them, he doesn't need to write this, but he's going to anyway to make sure they're clear. He's telling them about the unexpected, inescapable day of the Lord, He's given them two images, a thief in the night and sudden labour pains. And now he moves on. This is how to prepare. This is how to live in light of that coming day. And I think it's useful for us to keep these two images of a thief in the night and sudden labour pains and use those images to help us to understand these verses. Because that day won't be like a thief in the night for us and, and, and we won't face those sudden labour pains because we're going to prepare Hopefully we will prepare in this particular way. So thief in the night. Let's keep that image in our mind as we look specifically at verses 4 to 8. So although the day of the Lord will be unexpected, it will, it is, we do not know the exact time, the exact day. For Christians, it is not going to be an unexpected, unwelcomed intrusion. Look at verse 4. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that that day should surprise you like a thief. In other words, we have the memo. We've been told ahead of time. So because of that, this day is not going to be unexpected. It's not going to be unwelcome. There are two categories of people. Those who are in the dark about the day, and it's a willful darkness, they're choosing not to listen to God's warning signs, but then also those who belong to the day. That is a different way of distinguishing people who are followers of Christ and people who are not followers of Christ. Those who have been born again and those who have not. Those who believe the gospel and those who do not. So look at verse 7. We get details here in verse 7 about people who are in the dark, who this day is going to be a surprise for them, 
um, and how they're behaving. Verse 7. Those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. So this is God's word. This is God's evaluation of people who do not believe the gospel, who have not come to terms with Jesus ahead of time. It's like they are sleepwalking their way through life drunk. Now, some people sleep really soundly. I don't know if you're one of those people that's really difficult to wake up. And if someone sleeps really soundly, they're in a deep sleep. It can be hard to wake them up. When you are asleep, you are inactive, you are unresponsive, and you're oblivious to what's going on around you. Your house may have set on fire, and you're just a soundly asleep in bed, not knowing the danger that you're facing. That, of course, is why we have smoke alarms to make a loud noise, a loud warning. Wake up, don't stay asleep. Being drunk does part of your brain that controls how your body works. This affects your actions, your ability to make decisions, and to stay in control. So people who are not prepared for the final day of Christ are in the dark, asleep, and drunk. They are not ready because they are ignorant, unawares, inactive, making poor decisions, following their own desires, without restraint, and without self-control. Someone who is in that condition is a prime candidate for a thief in the night. But if you know Jesus, in complete contrast, you are in the light, which means this day isn't going to surprise you. And we get a whole different set of images to help us understand what it's like for us. Now, even though we don't know exactly when it's going to happen, we do know it is going to happen. It's a bit like you're watching the weather, the forecast says there is rain later in the day, so you leave the house taking an umbrella with you. You don't know when it's going to rain, but you know at some point it's going to rain. When it starts to rain, you don't go, wow, I never expected this. No, you get the brolly out. So what does it say about people who are in the light? Look at verse 5. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. And so, because we're in the light, we're not ignorant, we're not unawares, we're not inactive, we're not making poor decisions, we're not without restraint and self-control in complete contrast, verse 6, so then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. Now we need to be a little bit careful with the thief in the night imagery. A thief in the night is always a bad thing. But the return of Jesus is no bad thing for those who are expecting it. The point is, those who are not prepared should be terrified. But those who are prepared, it is not a day to dread. And because we know it's coming, we behave appropriately. Which is to be alert and self-controlled. Alert. Jesus could come back any time. Self-controlled, not driven along by our own desires and appetites. Instead, taking control of ourselves, submitting to Jesus and following him. Paul tells us how to do that in verse 8. Look down with me in your Bible. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. If you're preparing for battle, you need armour. Armour protects you. Without the armour, you are vulnerable to attack. It would seem the logic of this verse is quite simple. If you lack self-control, it's because you're not putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. If you're continuing to live in disobedience, it's because you are not putting on faith and love. You don't have the hope of salvation. The question is, how do we do that? 
Do we have wardrobes at home that have these things on? We take them down every morning. No, of course not. But each morning, each day, the settled habit of our lives is metaphorically we put these things on. So why not in the morning as we get out of bed, remind ourselves, today, I belong to Jesus. I believe in the work of the Holy Spirit. Lord, please help me to live according to your word. When we get up in the morning, remind ourselves that this world is not all that there is. We are made by a supernatural God who has demonstrated his love towards <coughs> us by giving his life so we can have life. Each morning, reminding ourselves that we are designed to pursue love. Love of Christ and love of others. That's what he expects of me. And to remind ourselves, salvation is coming. I'm going to see Jesus. I, he's going to come through the clouds and I will see the one who has pierced for my sin. The one who has crushed my iniquity. I'm going to see him. The reminder of Jesus and what it costs. And the fact that I will be with him one day will help me to love him and turn away from wrongdoing. What about that, these last few verses, 9 and 10? And then we'll look at verse 11 very briefly at the end. 9 and 10, please have in your mind this picture of sudden labour pains. These two pictures, a thief in the night, now sudden labour pains. That picture gives us the image of a sudden destruction that's going to come on people. Well, verse 9 and 10 teaches us that we have nothing to fear in regards to any sudden destruction. Why not? Verse 9, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation. Notice the difference, the contrast. Instead of receiving wrath from the Lord, we receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. The good news of the gospel is the wrath of God has already fallen on Jesus for sin. So this future wrath that's coming for unrepentant hearts doesn't need to fall on anybody who puts their hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have all fallen short of his glory. But God freely gives the salvation to those who come to him in Christ. Do you notice as well, this is Paul finishing off the section from last week. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. If we're alive, or if we pass into glory, nothing has changed for the believer. At the day of the Lord, all we'll receive is <coughs> salvation. And so, verse 11, I hope this morning that you are encouraged and built up. This is why we need each other. Why not downstairs, over coffee, tea, uh, a biscuit, Encourage each other. Remind each other that death is not the end. That when the Lord Jesus comes back, we will be vindicated. That's the purpose of these verses. For us to be encouraged and built up in the faith. So I urge you, be who you are. Live as someone who is in the light. We are in the light if we're in Christ. Be different. Be alert. Be self-controlled, self but chiefly be encouraged. Because of Christ, we have great hope and great certainty. What a day to look forward to. Let's bow our heads and pray before we sing our final <laughs> Father, there are a million and one reasons why this day this great day that's coming is so often absent from our thinking. So many things in life, legitimate things, necessary things that we need to deal with that can crowd you out of our thoughts. 
Forgive us when we live entirely by sight and not by faith. Please help us to live with our gaze firmly fixed on the return of Jesus. May our hope be fully there and nowhere else. There are so many things in this life that, that offer so much to us, but they cannot keep their promises. Only you can, Lord. So help us to be alert and self-controlled as we anticipate this great day. Please do a supernatural work in our lives, because we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to stand together to sing a song that again looks forward to that day. There is a day that all creation's waiting for, a day of freedom and liberation from the earth. And on that day, the Lord will come to meet his bride. And when we see him, in an instant, we'll be changed. Let's stand to sing. <coughs>
closing prayer. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Amen.